So welcome to our webinar today on managing CFS ME, a clinical approach, approach with me, myself, Dr. Nina Bailey. Um, and just to sort of start off with a, a few kind of intro slides. Um, so I'm going to use the uh, sort of abbreviation of just CFS throughout the webinar just for ease. Um, and you are probably all quite well aware of the fact that, you know, this is a condition causes fatigue that is severe enough to interfere uh, with a person's normal life. Um, and having looked at sort of NHS figures, it's estimated that around a quarter of a million of people in the UK actually have CFS. Uh, it's likely that these figures are very underestimated, though, given that the sort of diagnostic criteria is really to sort of rule out everything else. And then if you can't sort of explain this fatigue to then sort of make this sort of diagnosis of chronic fatigue. Um, we know that uh, it causes a high level of disability um, and usually the fatigue has to have been sort of apparent for at least six months before we kind of, you know, sort of get this label of, of CFS. Um, and again, sort of uh, various issues. There is no current cure. This isn't to say that people don't actually get better. Um, but we do know that there is, there is no kind of validated, universal, sort of accepted, one-size-fits-all approach to, to treatment. Um, and this is because of the sort of diverse amount of symptoms and the sort of diversity uh, associated with sort of factors that contribute to um, CFS. Um, and there are a variety of different treatments that are available, which I'll, I'll go over quite briefly a little bit later on. Um, but a lot of clients do seek natural alternatives to, to many of the sort of conventional approaches. Um, and it is likely that you will be faced with at some point um, during your careers uh, with a client coming to you with some sort of form of um, unexplained fatigue that might not necessarily be CFS, um, but hopefully by the time you've sort of finished listening to this webinar, um, you will have sort of gathered some information that may be of, of benefit within your practice. Okay. So just a, a very brief kind of overview of the causes and triggers. And a lot of these are very interlinked. Um, so we know that uh, a lot of people with CFS kind of sort of start off with a sort of sort of general sort of viral bacterial infection, something like glandular fever, for example. And then they just don't appear to be able to really kind of shake it off. Um, many CFS uh, individuals also have uh, or sort of um, present with sort of immune dysfunction. So for example, they, they tend to be TH2 dominance, which basically means that they don't have the capacity to sort of fight off viral infections, um, quite often presenting with reduced natural killer cells, for example. Um, there's an element of, or we do know that the that some people sort of, uh, the trigger can be something like stress or emotional trauma. Um, and this can be sort of interlinked with things like, you know, gut health. And, you know, if we have too much stress, this can affect our gut health. If we have compromised gut health or we have leaky gut, that can predispose us to sort of systemic inflammation. Um, and this will all come together at the end. So these are all kind of interlinked. Um, there's genetic predisposition. So, uh, you know, th this is probably not my area of expertise. So I'm not really going to go into it in too much detail. Um, but then environmental factors play a role as well. So again, a lot of CFS patients will present with multiple chemical sensitivities. Not all of them, but some of them. And then the big key player here is mitochondrial dysfunction. And actually, we can, we can link all of the above. So viral infections, immune dysfunction, etc, etc. All of these can be related to mitochondrial dysfunction. And we see that when we look at the symptoms. So the, the key ones which I've highlighted here are severe fatigue and post-exertional malaise. So where you know, symptoms get worse after physical or mental activity. Um, and this can be incredibly draining for, for, for patients and clients. Um, and this is what really kind of impacts on their sort of general well-being. Uh, a lot of people are unable to sort of function properly and can't go to work, you know, not being able to sort of like, you know, do sort of 
various sort of family things. So it's a really big player when it comes to sort of um, sort of compromising in activities, normal everyday activities. Um, some other symptoms, uh, again, not all of these symptoms are always apparent, but things like uh, sort of the, the classic brain fog. Um, a lot of CFS patients find that they, they sleep, but it's not um, it's not refreshing. They don't wake up feeling, you know, good at the, uh, you know, in the mornings. Um, sort of flu-like symptoms, muscle pains, headaches, generally sort of feeling sick and dizzy. Um, like I said, not everybody has all the symptoms, and this is what um, can make sort of, you know, uh, sort of interventions quite challenging. Um, but it's generally the kind of fatigue that is the real key player. Okay, so... So we're talking about fatigue, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I think before we can kind of really go into the details of fatigue, we have to understand what actually, you know, how, how energy is produced. Um, you know, and we all have this kind of basic sort of knowledge and everybody, you know, chats about, yeah, you know, fuel sources, we turn, we turn our food into energy and we have this sort of energy currency called ATP. But actually, there's a lot of processes involved here and a lot of processes that can go wrong and do go wrong. And by having that sort of understanding of the different stages and the different processes makes it a lot easier to start to understand how some of these interventions can sort of come into play. And it makes it a lot easier as well um, when you're kind of face to face with your client and you're sort of justifying an intervention. So if you're saying to somebody, you know, I really want you to take this ubiquinol product um, to be able to sort of just sort of very basically explain why you are um, recommending a particular intervention for that client. OK, so like I said, we have ATP. This is our energy currency. Um, but actually, once uh, ATP has been spent, Spent, um, it, uh, it sort of reduces down into um, ADP um, and then ADP has to sort of be recycled again. So whilst ATP is our energy currency, we actually don't have a huge amount sort of necessarily available. So it's constantly being sort of recycled. Um, and we can sort of we can sort of see this when you know if we're out and if we're running around or if you know cycling I cycle to work at the moment because the weather's quite nice and um, I soon know when my um, ATP levels are low because I, I can't pedal quite as fast as I normally can um, but anyway so we need to be making ATP on a nice regular basis and the whole process of taking the food turning it into ATP is basically, it's sort of broken down into four different areas. Um, so the first process is glycolysis. So glycolysis, we're taking glucose from carbohydrates and we are converting what is essentially a six carbon molecule into two, we're splitting it basically, and eventually sort of breaking it down into two three carbon pyruvate molecules. So those blue arrows are very heavily squashed down. There's a few processes in there that I've sort of excluded because we don't really need to know that much detail. But all we need to know is that glucose produces pyruvate and pyruvate then um, moves out of the cytosol and into the mitochondria. Pyruvate then has to be converted into acetyl coenzyme A, which then enters the citric acid cycle and the citric acid cycle starts to produce various different high energy molecules to then fuel the electron transport chain with the final process being oxidative phosphorylation which basically converts our ADP back into ATP and that's the kind of process. Now as long as glycolysis is happening um, properly um, and our glucose can move into our, or sorry, not our glucose, our pyruvate um, enters our mitochondria, then, you know, we have this process of being able to produce lots of molecules of ATP. So from one molecule of glucose, we should be able to produce um, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38 molecules of ATP. Now, if anything untoward happens within the mitochondria or pyruvate doesn't um, um, convert well to acetyl coenzyme A or something like that, then the, um, the body sort of kicks through and uh, glucose to pyruvate then converts through to lactate. 
Um, and we see this uh, in a lot of patients with um, CFS. And, and to be honest with you, you can do this yourself quite easily. So, you know, if you, if you do like a, quite a long sprint or something, you'll, you'll soon run out of your ATP and you'll start producing lactate as the body tries desperately to produce more ATP. The issue with um, converting through to lactate is that you only produce a couple of ATP molecules. So really we're looking at sort of very, you know, small change. You know, it's, it's a bit of energy, but it's really not enough. Um, so the ideal situation is to move into the mitochondria and um, to sort of do the whole process all the way through. So, okay, so let's have a look at some bits and pieces here that can kind of go wrong. Um, and then once we can sort of uh, start to have a, an understanding of how things go wrong, we can start to look at what are the interventions that can sort of help support. So very early on, if we're looking at sort of glycolysis, for example, it needs to be transformed into acetyl-CoA. Now, I, I, again, it's, it's one of those sort of like highly complex, there's, there's um, sort of enzymes and coenzymes all involved. Um, but one of the key, key areas here is that the coenzymes that are required to convert into co uh, acetyl-CoA um, are water-soluble B bits, for example. So we need thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, pantothenic acid, these are all B bits. Um, so this whole process here is actually really dependent on, you know, getting plenty of B bits in the diet. Um, so if we're thinking about things like um, B5, B3, B2, we're thinking things like organ meats, um, they're, sort of, they're very meaty actually, these bits of um, B bits. Um, there's a few sort of things like green veg are quite useful as well. Um, lipoic acid is another is another very sort of organ meat, red meat derived um, 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 acid. And then um, once we have all of these wonderful uh, vitamins and minerals, that's fine, we can start to produce all the coenzymes that are uh, uh, necessary um, for converting our pyruvate into co acetyl CoA. Um, and the other thing just to mention here is it's not just glucose actually that, that converts into acetyl-CoA. We can um, convert through from fat and protein. So fat through beta oxidation um, produces acetyl-CoA and protein um, can as well. So it's not all just about carbohydrate. But so, so we can start to see some, some of the, the areas that, where things can kind of go wrong here. If we can't produce pyruvate, um, and if we can't convert our pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. So, right, okay, so here's my fancy picture. This is the next stage. Right, okay, so pyruvate enters the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle itself, and again, we don't need to have a huge amount of knowledge about this, um, but the whole focus of the citric acid cycle is to produce high energy electrons in the form of these little, little guys down here. So we have NADH and FADH2, and these originate from the citric acid cycle. And then we can kind of, um, we can almost liken these as the sort of like the flame bearers that activate what's called the electron transport chain. So this is the electron transport chain across here. So our flame bearers, they come in and they're carrying these really high energy electrons um, and NADH, for example, spits in this electron here. And in doing so, we also get a couple of hydrogens sort of move into, um, into the intermembrane space here. Oh, I've gone a little bit too far there. Sorry about that. So, okay, so into the intermembrane space. Um, and then FADH comes in and does the same. And then we can see that we've got a couple of little molecules in the middle here. So we've got our, our complexes. So we've got complex one, two, three, and four. But in the middle, we have CoQ10 and we've got cytochrome C. And our electrons have to pass through or be sort of transported through um, via CoQ10 and cytochrome C. And I'm going to kind of go into a little bit more detail about those later and, and why CoQ10, for example, is so important, plays such a big role in sort of energy transfer. 
So this whole process is basically driving um, this what's called a proton motive force. So our hydrogens build up and it, it, it's kind of like this high energy um, and it's very, very kind of tense. And then what happens is that the energy builds up so much within this intermembrane space that the only way that these hydrogens can um, leave or get out is um, they get pumped through this last protein, the blue and purple one at the end. And it's this energy that is derived here that is involved in um, putting the phosphate group back onto ADP to produce our ATP. And that is the final process of um, respiration. So we, we start off with glycolysis, we have the citric acid cycle, we have the electron transport chain, and then our final part is our oxidative phosphorylation, which is the, the, the last piece here, which ends or culminates in the production of ATP. And you think, this is great, we've got ATP now. Um, and I wish it was as simple as that, but it gets a little bit more complicated. So there are a few things that can go wrong here. Um, and a, a lot of things that do go wrong, certainly in CFS. And I'll, I'll just kind of explain those in a, mi in a minute. But um, what we need to kind of understand is that the whole purpose of our mitochondria, and this is where all this sort of energy production takes place, is to generate ATP, which is energy rich, from ADP, which is our energy spent molecule. Um, CFS is characterized by slow recycling. So we need to have this kind of balance between ADP and ATP. And if you don't recycle at a, a particular rate, it's gonna make you tired, basically. Reserves of ATP are generally very low. And this ADP to ATP recycling has to be highly efficient because we need to keep our cells constantly supplied with energy. Okay, so our ATP plus phosphate produces an ATP. ATP gets spent producing ADP and then the cycle starts again. Fantastic, that's our recycling. Okay, if ATP is not available, and I'll explain in a minute why ATP might not be available, the body can use ADP, okay? And it does that by spending one of its phosphate groups. So you can combine two ADPs to produce an ATP, and then you get a little AMP on the side, so adenosine monophosphate. So this is um, just to sort of go back. So ADP is adenosine triphosphate, so it's got three phosphates, ADP, 2-phosphate, diphosphate, and then AMP, um, adenosine monophosphate, it's got one phosphate. Not very good at uh, sort of giving away a lot of energy here. So, um, so our ATP is the most energy dense, and then followed by ADP, and then AMP. The issue we have is that um, um, AMP doesn't get recycled very efficiently. And so if we do not recycle our ATP and we end up with AMP, then you kind of, this is what we see in CFS, is that the energy isn't there. Um, and it's such a slow process to start making ADP um, from scratch and ATP. Um, and this is partly um, because we need something called ribose. Um, and you will probably find, you know, if, if you've sort of looked at sort of protocols for CFS previously, that, that ribose is one of the sort of key ones. Um, so we don't just need ribose for things like ATP and ADP. We also need it for NAD and FAD, so our, you know, energy suppliers. So there's a lot of things kind of going on here and a lot of things that can kind of go wrong. So, like I said, okay, so within our electron phosphate um, or ele electron transport chain, sorry, we've managed to make our ATP molecule. However, okay, we make ATP in the mitochondria, but we don't spend it in the mitochondria. It has to move out of the mitochondria into the cell. Okay, so the transport itself is via this little, little protein that is embedded within the, um, within the membrane itself, okay and it's called the ADP, ATP transporter. Um, there's, it's got various other names as well, but it's probably just, this is the most simple, most sort of um, kind of obvious way of describing it. And it functions to exchange 
free ATP with free ADP. Um, and what I mean by free ATP is not bound to magnesium. So normally for ATP to be functioning, it has to be holding hands with a, with a magnesium um, iron. Um, so it functions basically to sort of pump out ATP from inside the mitochondria and in return, it's swapping this sort of ADP from outside. So the ADP has been spent, we need to get it back into inside um, the, inside the uh, mitochondrial matrix so that it can be sort of, you know, re-energized again back into ATP. And this transporter functions basically, so it's moving in and out all the time. So there's various sort of bits and pieces that can go wrong here too. So if our ADP to ATP transporter is blocked for any reason, then we might be making plenty of ATP, but it can't get out of the, the matrix to be able to be spent. Um, and again, we see this as a bit of a, a, an issue with people with CFS. So, okay, so what inhibits the transporter? Okay, so the first thing to consider is this sort of acid base. So we've got electrons, we've got the hydrogens um, between, the, um, between the two um, areas. So we've got within the uh, intermembrane space and then we've got the matrix space. And we need to, to make sure that, the, that it's almost like sort of having a particular element of tension. Um, that needs to be sort of this sort of driving force. Um, any other sort of factors that influence the transporter are things like low magnesium status, um, too much calcium. Um, so the sort of calcium magnesium balance has to be quite right as well. Um, we see things like the presence of toxic metabolites. So things like um, byproducts of viral or bacterial pathogens, um, they've been shown to block the transporter. Um, cellular dam damage from oxidative damage, um, environmental chemicals as well, which again helps to explain some of the sort of multiple chemical sensitivities that are experienced um, by some sufferers. And um, so what happens when we uh, block the ADP, uh, sorry, the ADP ATP transporter is that we get a compensatory activation of glycolysis to pyruvate. Um, and then the pyruvate gets converted to lactate because the body is desperately trying to spit out loads of ATP to be able to sort of deal with all the metabolic proce processes that require ATP um, as its form of currency. Um, and again, this is what we see with CFS is that, you know, we get this sort of um, increased levels of lactic acid, you know, you get the muscle burn, you get the, you know, the, the sort of cardiovascular sort of um, symptoms as well. So the palpitations, the, you know, chest pains and things like this. And this is all to do with the body desperately trying to up its ATP production. But again, it's um, the, the, the anaerobic conversion um, is just not really very efficient. Okay, so some other factors that influence these pathways. Um, high levels of reactive oxygen species, so oxidative stress, high levels of inflammation. Um, and again, these are sort of areas that have been well demonstrated within the sort of area of CFS. Um, if we have, for example, higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, this can lead to things like glutathione depletion, um, which uh, sort of upregulates things like nuclear factor kappa B, which then drives inflammation by triggering more pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you get this kind of um, constant sort of oxidative stress increases inflammation and inflammation then increases oxidative stress. Um, and our poor little CFS um, clients tend to be quite highly inflamed individuals. Um, and another thing uh, to sort of, sort of bear in mind here is that when we have high levels of oxidative stress, it tends to sort of um, push people through into this sort of uh, TH2 sort of dominance again. So if you're not already TH2 dominance, if you're not already um, 
unable to sort of deal with sort of vi um, sort of viral infections and things like that, then these higher levels of um, inflammation and, and oxidative stress are going to push you even more. So we can start to see how the this kind of almost like a cycling effect of um, sort of mitochondrial dysfunction and the high levels of, uh, of oxidative stress and inflammation, and then that impacts on our immune um, system. And um, if there is a viral sort of exposure there, then it's going to be incredibly hard to be able to deal with that. And I, I kind of mentioned this sort of quite early on is that CFS uh, clients tend to have very low levels of natural killer cells. So they're already sort of predisposed to sort of um, sort of viral infections. Um, and I mentioned earlier as well about the sort of the role of stress um, as a sort of factor um, predisposing people to things like CL, sort of fatigue and CFS, um, because if we're if we're very highly stressed, our little viruses, which tend to remain quite dormant, um, if we're immunocompromised, then viral load can sort of overtake, and this can sort of start to sort of eat away at things like our mitochondria, increase oxidative damage, um, increase inflammation, and again, so we, we sort of get into this sort of spiral of, of um, sort of symptoms that are related to CFS, um, and it's this sort of chronic. Um, TH2 bi um, bias and persistent viral activity that tends to explain why a lot of CFS um, individuals tend to sort of experience these very flu-like symptoms. Um, so later on we'll be discussing how we can sort of start to sort of look at how we break these kind of cycles, how we deal with it. So going back to our electron transport chain, just for a moment. So um, we've got some potential issues with getting our ADP and ATP in and out of our cells. Um, but we also have something called a, um, um, it's called the, it's basically it's a pore that sits within the membrane. And the, the function of this pore within our mitochondrial membrane is it's well, actually it's called the mitochondrial permeability transition pore but we'll just call it a pore for now is that it sits there and its role is basically to assess when the cell is experiencing any kind of level of stress if the cell is experiencing a level of stress it sends the signals through to um, tell that cell you know, we've got to cope with some damage here, guys. And, you know, we've got to close a few things down. We've got to look after ourselves. Um, factors that influence whether this pore is either open or closed are things like, again, high levels of calcium, oxidative stress, uh, CoQ10 deficiency. Um, it uh, can actually open the pore as well. So if everything is functioning and working properly on the inside. So if we've got no issues with things like CoQ10, if our ADP, ADP transporter is all working really quite nicely, then our pore tends to stay closed. Um, if there are high levels of inflammation, if we've got issues with CoQ10, if there's, you know, if we've got too much calcium around, then the pore um, will open. The opening of this pore Basically, it releases all the tension that is in this intermembrane space. So we then lose this um, this sort of uh, um, it's kind of well, basically it's like letting the pressure cooker lid off. So um, or deflating a balloon, everything sort of just goes a bit limp, um, and suddenly everything goes a little bit wrong. So um, if our pore opens, then our ADP to ATP um, um, transporter then starts to malfunction, everything kind of goes wrong. So this is an issue that we see as well. So there are lots of factors that can open this pore, making the mitochondria become leaky, swollen, uncoupled, and then the cell might die. So we've, we've now got a potential issue of um, poor quality mitochondria or mitochondria that are just sort of being killed off. And again, this is what we kind of see in um, um, people with CFS is that, you know, their mitochondria are either not working very well or you just have really sort of compromised numbers of healthy mitochondria. Okay, so yes, so, so just to sort of summarize really. So the opening of this pore 
helps to eliminate dysfunctional mitochondria and it's by the process of mitophagy. So it's a little bit like autophagy, but in mitochondria. Um, and um, basically, uh, yeah, I've kind of summarized this already actually. So, so lots of factors can um, contribute to opening of this pore, everything goes wrong. Um, and lots of factors can help keep this pore closed. So we can start to see that mitochondria themselves are susceptible to an awful lot of bits and pieces and, and sort of factors that can lead to them either not working properly or just kind of dying off. So we, we, we can start to sort of put together how, um, how we can kind of target these through various interventions. Right, okay, so one of the big um, sort of in, well, well, one of the big sort of nutrients that is really, really important when we're talking about mitochondrial function and certainly when it's sort of like looking at sort of ATP production is CoQ10. So CoQ10, as I said, it sort of sits in the electron transport chain and it's involved in passing electrons uh, along the, the electron transport chain. If you don't have enough CoQ10, that whole function is really compromised. Um, we can make a certain amount of CoQ10, but it's a long, laborious, um, very inefficient um, process that takes an awful lot of um, sort of ingredients to be able to do. Um, our ability to, to make CoQ10 diminishes as we get older. Um, I think it's, you know, the, the sort of literature suggests that when you sort of get to about 25 to 30, your ability to make CoQ10 peaks and it's all downhill from there. Um, so we can get CoQ10 from our diet to some extent. There's a very small amount in things like greens and stuff like that. But if you if you really want to get your CoQ10 levels up, you need to be eating a lot of organ meat, which is not everybody's cup of tea. But things like you know heart, kidneys, liver, great source of coenzyme Q10. Anyway, so CoQ10 deficiency. Again, if you look at the literature, there is there is really strong association between or correlation between CoQ10 deficiency and um, poor mitochondrial function in CFS patients. Okay, so not only does our CoQ10, or not only is CoQ10 involved in the electron transport chain, but actually it has various other roles within looking or making sure that our mitochondria stay healthy. Right. First thing is that it is an essential cofactor for the enzyme DHODH, and I'm just going to leave that one there, um, which is involved in basically making mitochondrial DNA. If you don't have adequate levels of CoQ10, not only is your ability to make ATP compromised, but actually your ability to make new mitochondria is also compromised. Okay, CoQ10 deficiency triggers the opening of our mitochondrial pore, um, and this leads to increased levels of oxidative stress, um, which itself is going to be pretty damaging to our poor little mitochondria. The pore opens, um, mitochondrial basically collapses, the membrane potential collapses, and our uh, ability to produce ATP is compromised. Okay, so CoQ10 is sitting at the top of this, um, playing a really kind of strong regulatory role here. So we need to make sure that our CoQ10, just in general life, let alone in sort of CFS um, patients, um, but actually, you know, CoQ10 is really, really important. Um, and um, so this, the, the, the higher levels of oxidative stress triggers our poor little mitochondria into uh, mitophagy. If you have too much, so mitophagy is a great thing. Um, mitophagy is really, really important in sort of getting rid of the sort of um, the riffraff and the bits and pieces that we don't want. Um, but actually, if you have excessive mitophagy, um, this can actually uh, sort of drive the cell into full apoptosis, so the whole cell dies which is going to exacerbate your ATP depletion. So if you're killing off your poor little mitochondria, then you're going to have even less capacity to make ATP. Okay. But mitochondria are really rather clever. Um, so whilst um, mitochondria would generally have uh, as a 
sort of background level of noise in terms of sort of oxidative stress. I mean, the whole kind of electron transport chain itself produces an awful lot of oxidative stress. Um, but there are sort of things like glutathione, CoQ10 in there as well, which is actually an antioxidant too, um, are there to sort of deal with it. So as long as your antioxidant enzymes and your antioxidant sort of reserves are high, then, you know, the, the fa fairly le low levels of reactive oxygen species can be dealt with. Um, and the mitochondria, so that be because they are so, so susceptible to accumulating ROS, um, will sort of naturally sort of die off or parts of them will die off um, to protect the, the sort of mitochondrial pool. Right, okay, so this probably best explained by my slide here. So mitochondria, they kind of, um, they originate, they're almost like sort of like little bacteria um, in that they can um, sort of regenerate themselves, if you like. Um, and what they will do, so you, you get your sort of mitochondria, it's a little bit damaged, but instead of killing off the whole cell or the whole, not a cell, the whole mitochondria, sorry. What happens is that they have these inbuilt mechanisms that allow them to basically chisel away the bits that they don't want. So if we look at the bit, um, the bit in the middle here, so we've got these, um, we have a mitochondria, um, some of it is damaged, it all gets squashed down one end, um, and it basically gets dissected. So the bad bits get dissected off. They then go and follow off through this autophagosome and then they get, you know, under mitophagy and they get eliminated basically. And then all the little good bits that are left over all join up by this uh, process called fusion. So our mitochondria are really well adapted to deal with high levels or you know, relatively high levels of reactive oxygen species. Um, they can sort of repopulate themselves, they can chisel away the bad bits. And, and so we, we kind of get this pool, hopefully, of you know, good quality, high numbers, healthy mitochondria. That's, that's in the sort of best sort of idea concept. This is not what we see in CFS, unfortunately. Okay, so then we have to sort of make sure that our balance of um, sort of mitochondrial bioenergetics, if you like. So we, we, we have this process of fission, you know, we kind of divide it all up, and fusion. So we split ourselves, but then we have to, do, you know, we have to join it all back together again. And again, it's all about sort of various proteins and enzymes, and um, and we have a sort of energy sensors in the form of something called AMPK that sort of dips its finger in the in the air and sort of works out when something's going on. This then sort of triggers this process of biogenesis by activating a particular master regulator called BGC1 alpha, which then sort of upregulates our, our our DNA. Um, and we start producing all of these sort of factors and proteins and things that are involved in these processes. So everything's upregulated, everything's working nice and, and steadily. Right. Okay, so this is where CoQ10 really comes into play because if we start to downregulate various um, sort of uh, proteins or the, the ability to make these proteins that in, are involved in sort of fission and fusion, then the whole process of biogenesis starts to go array. And this is where we kind of sort of look, look at the look at um, sort of CoQ10. So down in the in the in the corner there in the red. So our our ability to make D, uh, mitochondrial DHA is compromised by low CoQ10. So again, um, so this is this is all kind of relating to um, people with CFS. Uh, not only can they not produce. Um, ATP in the sort of you know normal regulatory sort of fashion, um, but actually their, their poor little mitochondrial numbers and the quality of their mitochondria are also compromised. So the the whole kind of interventions that we're sort of talking about here are really sort of focusing on um, making sure that our mitochondria are healthy, making sure that our mitochondria are good in numbers, making sure that we are supporting 
our mitochondrial bioenergetics so that they in turn can start producing the, uh, the, the, the good quality sort of ATP that we need to be able to function and pay all of our metabolic bills. Right, okay, so finished talking about mitochondria for a minute. I'm now going to move on to something called the glutathione depletion methylation cycle block. So um, at some point when you're sort of, you know, looking after your clients, you will come across sort of methylation and methylation cycle and methylation factors and, and how this sort of, inter, you know, sort of plays into sort of detoxification and all these other kind of bits and pieces. Um, in terms of looking at sort of oxidative stress and methylation and how this then relates to CFS, we've got high levels of um, oxidative uh, stress going on. Um, and we have various sort of sulfur containing amino acids, methionine, cysteine, uh, really important in methylation, that are incredibly sensitive to um, um, high levels of oxidative stress. And this has a direct impact on methylation processes. And we see this in CFS because, and again, this is not, you know, as black and white as saying that all CFS patients or clients are going to sort of be sort of suffering with this, but we quite often see high levels of homocysteine um, as a consequence of uh, this sort of methylation block. And, and quite often this is to do with methionine synthase. So our enzyme that is uh, directly involved in sort of regulating homocysteine within this sort of cycle. If you, if you mess around with my, uh, methionine synthase, you get high levels of homocysteine. Right, okay, so... Um, a very busy slide so let me just kind of go through this a little bit and it's really to sort of highlight that um, so up the top we've got our folic acid cycle and we've got methylation um, if everything is um, working properly you know we've got you know healthy levels of neurotransmitters methylation's great you know we've got things like coq10 is made nicely um, fatty acids are made all of these kind of functioning things that is in, as, a, as a consequence of healthy methylation in CFS, what we find is that we have high levels of oxidative stress, blocks the methylation cycle, and when we start to have this sort of subsequent negative impact on glutathione, because if you have high levels of homocysteine, you can't make glutathione. Okay, so your glutathione levels drop, uh, oxidative stress then increases, or reactive oxygen species increase, and again, as I've mentioned earlier, we see this drive through towards TH2 dominance. And this, again, leaves our, our patient immunocompromised. So again, going back, you know, if they've got, you know, heavy viral load, they're not going to be able to deal with that. Um, it also impairs detoxification. Okay, so we get toxic accumulation, which is then going to be driving more inflammation, driving more oxidative stress. And this whole cycle is just kind of going on and on and on and on. Um, but this also has an impact on gut health as well. Okay. So just a, a quick note on glutathione, just sort of a really important, uh, you know, and I've talked about this in sort of um, past webinars that we've sort of um, um, sort of done for you guys. Uh, Increasing glutathione, so really important to upregulate glutathione-related enzymes, um, things like glutathione reductase, transferase, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, anything that sort of cruciferous vegetables, anything with cysteine in it, for example, is going to be really good. Um, Sulfur-rich foods, onions, garlics, really good to get these in our diets. Um, you can get glutathione um, supplements directly, or the other option is to directly supplement with L-acetylcysteine, which is really, really good for supporting um, glutathione levels. So just sort of touching on that very briefly there. Okay, so the next area to sort of focus on in terms of the impact of high levels of inflammation, high levels of oxidative stress is the impact that this has on our ability to make sort of various normal neurotransmitters, um, you know, serotonin, dopamine, etc, etc. 
what we find is that um, when you've got high levels of inflammation, high levels of oxidative stress, is that we get this shunt away from uh, tryptophan moves away from making serotonin or the serotonin pathway, and we end up making um, sort of a sort of neurotoxic quinolinic acid. Um, and this sort of sits and activates our NMDA receptor, um, which basically, you know, they, they, I've, I think I've said in sort of uh, talks that I've given before that if you if you constantly dig away at NMDA, basically it, it just literally it sh starts to shrink your brain away. So we, we start to get things, you know, things like the brain fog. Um, you know, it really hits things like sort of our mood. Um, we can't sleep properly. Um, cognitive dysfunction. A lot of these symptoms are really related to tryptophan shifting away from serotonin and sort of being driven this way. And it's all through sort of upregulation of this enzyme, this key enzyme called IDO. And quinolinic acid itself is, you know, it then sort of has an impact on things like sort of glutamate GABA ratios. Um, it interferes with various enzymes that are involved in sort of balancing. So glutamate, you know, we, we need a certain amount of glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter, but we also need to balance that out with enough GABA as well, which is our sort of inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, we need various cofactors as well. So we've uh, vitamins um, uh, B6 and magnesium are key players. Um, and the other thing about magnesium is that magnesium sits in the NMDA receptor and it basically acts like a little gatekeeper. So it will stop NMDA being overactivated. So you can have high levels of things like glutamate and quinolinic acid, but as long as your magnesium levels are, are, are adequate and high enough, um, then it sort of sits in the receptor and it goes, well, back off, you know, quiet and down. And, and it plays a really kind of sort of calming um, sort of role, which is why actually people say magnesium is like the, the sort of, um, it, it is so calming. Okay, right. And another thing that quinolinic acid does is it's, it inhibits various mitochondrial complexes. So if we're, if we're thinking back to our um, electron transport chain, we've got our complex one, complex two, three, and four, et cetera, et cetera. Quinolinic acid um, inhibits these complexes. So um, just by having high levels of uh, inflammation, high levels of oxidative stress, kind of almost indirectly impacts on our ability to make ATP. So again, we can start to see how all of these um, sort of mechanisms are all inter interrelated with each other. So one of the sort of key um, sort of therapeutic interventions here is really to start looking at how we can look after our inflammatory processes, how we can dampen down sort of inflammation, how we can combat oxidative stress. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll go into those in a little bit more detail later. Oh, okay, so here's my magnesium and GABA slide, really sort of highlighting the the, the sort of um, transfer of glutamate to GABA. Probiotics as well very good for um, sort of balancing out the, the glutamate GABA um, sort of pathways. So, right, okay, so I've done a lot of talking and I've talked about lots of different types of mechanisms, um, but we can start to sort of see how they are all interlinked with each other. So we've got inflammation, we've got um, oxidative stress, um, how this starts to impact on mitochondria functioning, um, whether it be on our mitochondria themselves, whether it's the whole process of being able to make ATP or whether it's in the process of actually making ATP, but then getting it out where it can be used. Um, we have low, uh, low antioxidants, high levels of oxidative stress, reduced CoQ10, and so on and so on and so on. So we have this high level of inflammation that is related to mitochondrial dysfunction. And these are all interlinked with sort of symptoms of fatigue. Um, and then just um, going to get through and start talking about some interventions soon, but just a little touch because I think this is really important as well is, you know, if you've got clients coming to you with sort of un 
you know they, they've got fatigue you're not quite sure where the origin is you don't quite know whether they've actually got cfs but one of the sort of key things to really look at is gut function as well so make sure um, you know, make sure that the client's gut health is is good, um, because again, sort of things like leaky gut and CFS, there's a there's quite a you know a close association there as well. You know, if gut function is 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 all askew, dysbiosis, leaky gut, you know, gut barrier um, is compromised, then this leads to systemic inflammation, which can you know if 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 it isn't the sort of trigger for CFS, then it's certainly going to be um, sort of driving it. So making sure that clients have got good, healthy, um, functioning gut. So a really good gut protocol is is really essential as well. You know, the kind of standard things, you know, probiotics, prebiotics, getting plenty of fermented foods in there, um, glutamate, uh, vitamins A and D, you know, supporting Sig A, for example, um, the you know the sort of standard gut um, sort of protocols that you you would apply to to any client. So making sure that your CFS or your your fatigued client has good functioning gut is really really important. Okay, so right, we're going to start talking about some treatments now, or sort of some interventions. And if we look at the sort of standard treatments, what's actually out there, and I'm not talking about nutrition quite yet, um, you, you can start to see, because the symptoms are so diverse, and, you know, the, the triggers are also so diverse, you know, it's, it's really difficult to know exactly um, how your client has a, you know, sort of has ended up, I guess, with, with CFS, um, you know, and the standard sort of protocols from, you know, can involve anything from sort of painkillers, of course, um, through to antidepressants. And actually the SSRIs in terms of things like um, sort of cognitive function and sleeping can actually be quite useful, obviously with anything like um, sort of painkillers, antidepressants, they're going to kind of exacerbate any sort of nutrient deficiencies that might be going on. So you need to sort of play those in mind or take those into account as well. Um, exercise therapy, there's some really strong evidence behind pacing. Um, it's all about balancing activity with rest. That can be really, really useful. Um, the lightning process, must admit, I'm, you know, my, my experience of, or my knowledge of the lightning process isn't, uh, isn't particularly strong, um, but I am aware that, you know, some people have found this to be quite useful. It's a combination of osteopathy, um, life coaching and sort of brain training. So kind of similar almost like to CBT. Um, there were some really interesting publications uh, a few years back that was basically saying CBT is a really effective for managing CFS. And a lot of people said, oh, that's really terrible. You can't say that because that just kind of makes it sound like it's, it's more of a mental health thing. Um, and actually, the way that CBT is useful is really all about sort of lowering inflammation lowering cortisol and sort of rebalancing that. Um, so there has been some evidence, some, some quite good supporting evidence for something like CBT, but it depends on um, various kind of other factors that are going on as well. What, you know, what, what is the root of the, the CFS? What is the cause of the CFS? So it might be useful for some people, less so for others. Um, and then we have lymphatic massage. So we, we work quite closely with Dr. Raymond Perrin um, so we're very kind of um, in tune with his lymphatic massage. And we know that it is incredibly in, uh, effective, certainly in combination with sort of nutritional support um, as well. So it's, it's based on a, a sort of technique to make sure that the, the lymphatic system is working efficiently to be able to sort of get rid of all the sort of built up toxins and various bits and pieces that are sort of going on as well. Um, and it can make people feel pretty awful for, for a fair few weeks as, you know, um, especially if things like, um, sort of methylation isn't working properly, or if your detox pathways aren't working properly, you know, you're sort of getting all of these, um, sort of toxins out of the system, but if you can't cope with them, then, you know, you're, you're, you're going to start to feel really awful. So it's a combination of these kind of examples of treatments in combination with nutritional support as well is really really vital and if you can get it right it it can be really really effective okay so 
Um, there may be some tests that you might find really, really useful because again, everybody is very different. We need to sort of try to figure out what is the root, you know, what, what, what is everybody's individual because no, no two CFS um, clients are going to be exactly the same. So, you know, some people might have issues with methylation, others might have issues with detox. You know, it's really, really difficult to say. Um, one of the big factors or one, one thing that I've been sort of reading up a lot and I, I think is really, really strong is ATP profiling. Um, and this is um, sort of really driven by Sarah Myhill, which um, I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with Sarah Myhill's work. Really, really effective. So um, she's got, uh, uh, I think, three or four publications now where she's, she's detailing sort of mitochondrial function tests. Um, and if you do have a client with CFS, I would highly recommend this. Um, and the reason that I recommend or would recommend this is because when we are considering mitochondrial function, um, and I, I hope that, you know, I've kind of explained everything to an extent where it sort of kind of makes sense. There are so many different areas within the sort of mitochondria and our ability to make ATP that can be compromised. And this test really highlights exactly where the issue is. Okay, so the profile test really kind of looks at, you know, are we recycling ATP? Is that the issue? Or we're not recycling ATP? Is that the issue? Um, is it that we're not transferring our ATP out of the mitochondria into the cytosol efficiently? Okay. So that might be the issue. Is it, you know, is it a case that the ATP, ADP um, sort of transporter is blocked? Um, and so this test is really, really useful for identifying exactly where the issue is within the mitochondria. And then we can start to look at, you know, exactly what sort of intervention is going to be best for that person. Um, additional tests include things like, you know, are we making, you know, you know, are, are B3 levels adequate enough? Um, you know, L-carnitine, you know, that's, that's a really important one as well. I was talking about beta oxidation of fatty acids a little while earlier. If you don't have enough carnitine, you can't transfer your long chain fatty acids. Um, and CoQ10 as well, measures CoQ10, really, really, really important. So not only in, as an antioxidant, but it's also, you know, really important for electron transfer um, within the electron transfer chain, but it's also really important in making the mitochondrial DNA to allow the mitochondria to be able to expand and, and you know, replicate and make sure that levels are healthy. So when we're thinking about nutritional interventions, we're really kind of thinking about, you know, is it a substrate uh, deficiency? Is it an inhibition of function? We can start to look at all of these various sort of aspects um, where um, interventions might be really useful. So, you know, do we need to target methylation, detox, oxidative phosphorylation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Supporting mitochondrial biogenesis. Okay, so again, this is a really exciting area that is really kind of developing. It's like targeting our mitochondria. And it's not just about targeting sort of um, mitophagy, but autophagy as well. So we know that sort of exercise is really useful, which, you know, where pacing and things like might that come in quite useful. Cold treatment, ubiquinol, EPA, DHA, omega-3s. Um, one of the big ones, obviously, is sort of calorie restriction, intermittent fasting has, has a really good strong um, link with sort of um, increasing our mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, various polyphenols. So, you know, we've got a great curcumin product if you're, if you're interested in polyphenols. Um, but to sort of really kind of focus on, um, and I'm really going to be kind of focusing on our range of products that we have here now. So one of the first things that you really need to look at is restoring magnesium levels. Um, and magnesium deficiency is really quite common within the sort of UK population as it is. But with people with CFS, their magnesium levels are usually, usually deplete. Um, and if we think about the role of magnesium, not just in sort of ATP, but all of these other enzymes that are involved in energy production. So, you know, it's not just about making ATP, it's also, you know, glycolysis and electron transport chain, all these other processes as well. If you don't have enough magnesium, then you're going to have some major issues. 
um, and that's pretty sort of early on within this whole process. So restoring magnesium. Um, and I don't know whether any of you guys have listened to our magnesium webinar. Um, if you haven't, I would highly recommend it because it really emphasizes how magnesium supplements are so very different. Um, we obviously, you know, it is not in our interest to be ma making recommendations for magnesium or any other sort of product that is not going to be highly effect, uh, efficient in doing what we want it to do. We use three different types of magnesium. We use them in their fully reacted forms um, and we, um, we dose it. So we, we purposely um, encourage people to split dose our magnesium. Um, and we do this because smaller amounts of magnesium are absorbed much more efficiently than large amounts of magnesium. So it's, it's, it's really a kind of a three times a day. We, um, we use three different forms of magnesium. One of those is magnesium citrate. So this is going to be directly beneficial to supporting the citric acid cycle. Um, so that's our magnesium. You can find out a little bit more about that on our website. And like I said, we, we've got a, a, a specific uh, webinar dedicated just to our magnesium, which you might find of interest. Um, the next step is fatty acids. Okay, so EPA, DHA, GLA, really, really important in maintaining cell, cell structure, cell fluidity, especially within the sort of mitochondria, but more so in um, sort of regulating inflammation. So low levels of omega-3, which are really common in the UK population anyway, because we don't eat enough fish and there's not enough omega-3 in our fish anymore anyway. Um, but it, the lower the levels of your omega-3, the higher your um, levels of inflammation are more likely to be. And we know that people with CFS tend to have lower levels of EPA and DHA, and they also have higher levels of um, arachidonic acid, so this our pro-inflammatory omega-6 um, to EPA, so our anti-inflammatory omega-3. So restoring our AA to EPA ratio is really, really important. And just to kind of really emphasize is my lovely little picture just explaining the, the two families here. So all of these enzymes involved in making our um, omega-3s are dependent on things like, you know, B vits and, and vitamin C, zinc and magnesium. We need to make sure that our nutrients are really, really um, sort of nice and sort of restored. Um, we know that people with CFS tend to have uh, levels of inflammation that are directly correlated with their symptoms. So ensuring um, they get good quality omega-3s is really, really important. Um, and in fact, we have a, a protocol that is specifically targets um, sort of uh, down-regulating inflammation or, or helping to support healthy inflammatory responses. So we start with a pure EPA product and then we move on to support with EPA, DHA and GLA at a later stage. We also emphasize the importance of fatty acid testing. Um, and the reason for this is that we know that the levels of omega-3 within our cell membrane are, are really important. We should aim um, ideally to have levels of about 8%. So 8% of all the fats within your cell membrane should be EPA and DHA. Um, and if you are not achieving the levels, then quite often you will find that um, you don't sort of experience symptom remission. So it's really, really important. And the other factor to sort of just focus on very quickly here is that that very first enzyme, delta-6 desaturase, you're probably all very familiar with that. If you have a little viral infection, that viral infection will just completely wipe out delta-6 desaturase. So it is not surprising that people with CFS who do have sort of low sort of, um, sort of viral infections have naturally low levels of omega-3 um, because they just don't have the capacity to, um, to be able to make long chain fatty acids. If you supplement with pure EPA, EPA kills viruses. So you're killing two birds with one stone. You're restoring your, um, um, yeah, your levels of omega-3, um, but you're also helping to sort of eradicate this sort of viral load that, 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 
that is um, um, is going to be there. Um, next thing to sort of talk about is making sure that your antioxidant capacity is supported. You need really good, strong quality antioxidants. So, I um, mean, we're talking about things like making sure you've got plenty of vitamin E, vitamin C, really, really good quality. And it's all about sort of diversity as well, because a lot of the antioxidants will be recycling each other. And that's really important. When we're talking about really hardcore inhibition of oxidative stress, we are making a recommendation for our astaxanthin. The reason we say astaxanthin as a primary antioxidant is the way that it sits and incorporates itself into cell membranes. It is the only antioxidant that spans. So it's, it pokes out of one end of the cell membrane and it pokes out on the other on the inside of the cell membrane, but it also spans the the inner bit as well. So the the it's it basically it spans the whole cell membrane inside and out and in the middle. Um, and in terms of its sort of ORAC value, it's it is the highest that you can really kind of get. So in terms of sort of antioxidant support, um, astaxanthin is is our sort of key player really here as well. Um, we go uh, high dose, four milligrams, um, and it comes with a sort of natural complex of, of other carotenoids in there as well. Um, and because it is so very potent, um, you, can, you can have a, a happy dose of just one capsule a day to give you good, strong quality antioxidant support. Um, and unless you're eating things like wild salmon and you know lots of different sort of other sort of seafoods, anything pink basically is going to be a sort of astaxanthin supplier, then it's likely that you're not going to have much astaxanthin in your diet anyway. So supplementation is really, really, really important. Okay, Q10. Okay, I have, I have spoken so much about the benefits of CoQ10, um, and I can't uh, emphasize this enough in terms of sort of, um, sort of helping to manage CFS. Um, it's really kind of important to understand as well. CoQ10, ubiquinone versus ubiquinol. Okay, so ubiquinone is known as CoQ10, but in its, um, in its reduced form, it's called ubiquinol. Its reduced form is the antioxidant form, um, and it wasn't available uh, in supplements until about 2006. And since 2006, um, publications behind and supporting ubiquinol over ubiquinone in terms of bioavailability, in terms of antioxidant function, in terms of neuroprotective benefits, um, really, really, really supporting. So. Um, our recommendation, if you're looking at coenzyme Q10, is firstly to look at ubiquinol. Um, the second issue that we have with ubiquinol and ubiquinone is that it's fat soluble. We don't absorb it very efficiently. So if you're taking a standard CoQ10 product, the majority of it will be just flushing straight out. You need to make sure that you are using some sort of delivery system. We've done our research and um, we use something called Vesisorb. So you can get Vesisorb delivered. Uh, you know, Vesisorb is the delivery, basically, the delivery mechanism. So it's a, it's a kind of a fatty, fatty system that, that surrounds the ubiquinol. Um, and it uh, basically, in terms, you, know, you can see it from the slide, its capacity or its ability to um, raise ubiquinol levels um is you know strong is, is better than uh, than other forms so we are able to deliver uh therapeutic um therapeutically viable levels with just 100 milligrams dose okay so and uh, if you look at the the literature a lot of recommendations are you know 300 400 500 milligrams of you know coq10 but actually if you're do it, it's not about how much you take it's about how much you absorb and how much you retain Vesisorb is the best delivery for, for ubiquinol. Um, we would, uh, for particularly challenging symptoms, we would recommend two a day, um, one in the morning and one in the evening. And then just a little note here on why CoQ10 is so important. And actually, um, like I said, we can make it, but my goodness, it's, it's a very slow, laborious 
um, process. Um, and it also requires uh, adequate levels of vitamin B6 as well, which leads me on to our Super B complex. Um, Super B is one of our best selling products and one of the reasons we get so much really good, strong, positive feedback on our Super B is because uh, we use pre-methylated B bits. So again, we, we um, focus on using the most bioavailable, most body ready, most effective forms of B bits um, and at doses that have been scientifically shown to manage healthy homocysteine levels. So we're kind of, you know, the homocysteine is really about your B6, your B12 and, um, and your folate as well. So we uh, I mean, this is, this is certainly for methylation support. This is the top um, um, product. Um, for B12, you might find that uh, CFS patients or some of the CFS patients may need to have um, injections of B12 to get their levels up. But again, it's sort of, you know, testing and, and sort of making that sort of decision really. Um, but we go for split dosing, slow release. One of the issues with B12 is that the uptake pathways saturate really easily. So you can take a high dose B12, but you know, unless you're split dosing and unless you're, you, you're formulating so that it's released slowly, you're not going to be able to absorb it. So again, we get really good feedback on our B, B complex because of its energy boosting um, ability. So um, really it's, it's, you know, to sort of summarize what we're sort of talking about here is, you know, we're looking at, you know, increasing our, our mitochondrial capabilities, our biogenesis. We need to be reducing inflammation, reducing oxidative stress. So we need antioxidants. We need omega-3s. We need to reduce our infl inflammation with EPA. We need to sort, support methylation. Um, so our super B complex by supporting methylation, you will be naturally increasing your capacity to make things like glutathione. Um, so you will be supporting detox, but obviously, you know, you can sort of look elsewhere and, and things like, you know, um, um, milk thistle and, um, and those kind of things. Cysteine is really good for sort of detox as well. Um, and improving energy via ATP, we're talking about um, ubiquinol, really, really efficient as well. So as a summary of our, um, of the products that I've kind of talked about here, um, we generally kind of say, you know, if you can with omega-3s, if you, if you can get your client to just sort of take the Optio 3 biomarker test, we would recommend that. Um, and the reason for that is, um, you know, we target, well, we look at the results and we, you know, we work out how to get the client's omega-3 index at a therapeutic range over 8%. We reduce their AA to EPA ratio, which is their sort of marker of inflammation, through to a healthy ratio of about 1.5 to 3, something like that. Um, and then really kind of, you know, this is, this is where we are with sort of dosing and duration. And you will find that, you know, it will take about six months really. Um, to sort of, you know, this is a slow process, um, you know, and, um, but, you know, clients should be able to start to see various improvements over, over those six months. If you want a bit of extra reading, these are a couple of books that I would highly recommend. Obviously, Sarah Myhill is much more of the sort of mitochondrial expert than I am. Um, she puts an awful lot of extra information in there about sort of um, other beneficial nutrients that she would sort of recommend, certainly. Um, so that's a really, really good book to sort of take away and have a look at if you haven't already got that one. Um, and then if you want to just sort of know a little bit more about mitochondria, um, this is a, a book that was published last year by Ray Griffiths, and it's really useful for sort of highlighting mitochondria, not just sort of for, um, for CFS, but, you know, he covers various other sort of, um, sort of health areas and diseases as well there. So that's really kind of a, a worth having a look at as well. Um, and if you've got any information or if you want any more information or if you just sort of want to know a little bit more about our products or our other products or, you know, anything else that we are doing, if you want to know about future webinars, then please 
do feel free to get in touch. We'd be most happy to help. And I'm just going to have a little look at the chat now, see if there's any questions that I might be able to... Oh, ha, ha. Hopefully... Oh, right. Lucy has asked if acetylcysteine is better than NAC. I think they are the same, actually, Lucy, to be honest. Why? L acetyl. Oh, N. I think I might have um, confused myself there then. I meant N acetylcysteine. Um, brilliant. Okay. Hmm. Some interesting questions. Right, okay, so I am aware that we have gone over. Um, so we have taken notes of some of the more complex questions here, and I will get back to you in person with a little bit more in depth of an answer. Um, and at this point, I would just like to say thank you very much for taking your lunches out. And, um, and I hope to see you again at some future webinars.